Well, of course, again, thank you, Julio, Marius, Destiny, and everyone involved, the organization, people here. It's very good to have this kind of conference, like more specific, right? With people from different community, right? very important for the field. So, oh, this, what I'm going to talk today, it's a work made with our group, University of Tokyo, the group of Mio Murao, and actually, we are all from the same group, and it's based like on two recent works. So good. Mm -hmm. I see why everyone is saying that it's opposite. <laughs> so the, the, the goal, so the Hold, You know the tree, it's called it uh, around like, like that, yeah. Ah, but then if I want to use the point, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you, you, you cannot have everything. Perfect, yeah. Yes. <laughs> anyway, so. the works have been finishing, but uh, it seems that uh, apparently the ideal place to stand is here, because you would be ah. feeling the better. If ah, okay. If we're talking yeah. about all these logistics, that's the best thing. Good. Yeah. So, uh, so the, the main goal, like, of this work, like is how to transform like a quantum reversible operation into its inverse. So one starting point, like in, in quantum mechanics, well, you we, we can imagine heavy states, and one simple way to understand dynamics is to imagine that you have this notion sometimes say like channels or operations. Then you just have an input and output. So if you have a quantum state, you can imagine that like this is a quantum state. If you like this quantum circuit picture, it passes through this device. So here it's one, one input. What goes out is an output. So you can understand this is a quantum operation. And there are some quantum operations where we can inverse. They are naturally reversible. And these ones are the unitary operations. And our goal is to transform, I'll say, the most basic thing I could imagine, right? So it's, if you have an operation that is reversible, I want to transform it to its inverse. So probably it's still not clear at all what I meant. So, and then, <laughs> <laughs> OK. So and then you can ask, what do we want? So, well, if you imagine, like, he wants to invert like quantum operations, but one simple example, like the Pauli operation, operation like the sigma z, well, the inverse is itself, so you don't need to do anything. So sometimes this task is like trivial. So then what do we want? I think instead of just writing the formal definition, I'll show you how I got there, actually. So we would like something like this. So this picture here, like, represents this quantum circuit. I think many of you are familiar, but well, time flows from left to right. And how do you understand this picture? So this U2 here represents a qubit unitary operation. So it's, you can imagine a unitary operator, right? And it's sigma y, well, it's the Pauli sigma y. But it turns out that for any qubit unitary operation, if before you do a sigma y and after you do a sigma y, this whole block here, you can understand as the complex conjugate of the unitary. And it's very simple, right? So this is the reason why I started like, to work with this problem in this field. So who showed me that for the first time was this Miyazaki that was a PhD student in the group when I arrived. And now he's a Buddhist monk in a temple in Kyoto. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I'm, I'm going there soon like, to visit him to show like, this paper. He's not aware <laughs> that it started with his idea. But he's still in physics, so. Actually, we don't know, because it was not possible to talk to him when he was there. Like one year like training, with, he could receive I think one letter per week. Well, but he's not hard at physics. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, I'll meet him maybe in two or three months, and I'll, I can tell you after. But, but for me, this was very surprising, this result here. I think this is very nice. How, because it works for any unitary, anything you do. If someone asked me before, hey, Marco, can you imagine a way if you have like a unitary, you transform to its complex conjugate? I think I would say first it's impossible. I don't know. Because they try to imagine for quantum states, like the complex conjugates, transposition that we know you cannot do. Like, and actually, it's trivial. So what do we want? What I would like? It's something like this. I would like to have a qubit unitary, in particular any unitary. You do something before, you do something after, and you reverse it. It works for any unitary. You want to be universal. Even if you don't have a classical description, anything you plug, poof, unitary goes out the inverse. So that's what I want, basically. So. Well, and here I'm just writing the reason why this works. It follows from this mathematical identity here. I think not so Im important for now. Good. Well, and another like motivation as well, like it's I said, it's better like understand better like transformation between quantum operations because usually in quantum mechanics, people think a lot like if you have a quantum state, then you can transform it like doing these quantum channels, and we know a lot about these quantum channels. Well, well, quantum channels itself, they can be transformed. You can understand quantum channels as a state, basically, and say that I want something like a super channel. 
we saw many talks here, this guy, this super map, super channel, like the quantum switch would be an example. And I think if you want to understand transformation between operation, well, unitaries, they are very important. And the most basic thing you can do with unitaries is to invert. So that's one personal motivation. So let's go. We want something that is universal, like that works for any unitary, like in principle, even unknown. The only thing you know is a dimension. And well, since you ask, let's try to ask like a lot. Like I want to be exact, like the complex conjugation, like perfect. And first question, like, is such a thing possible? And well, it, it turns out that we were not the first one to ask these questions. Well, in this work with Julio and Daniel Ebler, basically they consider this problem and they even calculate the optimal average fidelity. <coughs> so they want a deterministic case and they found the optimal average fidelity is given by two over d squared. Well, that somehow solves the problem we ask, right? So it's not possible. Fidelity for any dimension here, it's smaller than one, so it's not possible. Well, but instead of giving up, we change a bit the question. Like, now I want to be probabilistically, so I accept failing. But when I get it right, I know I get it right. So this notion of probabilistic heralded, that basically you're going to do like a measurement that says like, correct, like great, it worked, or like fail. But you know exactly when you, you have success or failure. And it turns out that it's possible for qubits. And I'll even say like more than possible, it's trivial. <laughs> okay, maybe not trivial, well, depends on how close. So let's try to understand. This is the circuit that I claim to implement this unitary inverse. So here, this represents an arbitrary qubit state. So here you can plug any quantum state you want. This unitary here, it's an any qubit unitary. Actually, maybe now I see that I should have put this two here like in different colors. These are anything you want. Everything else here, they are fixed elements of my quantum circuit. So basically, how does it go? This, it's a maximally entangled state. So like a Bell state, it's phi plus. Qubit maximally entangled state. Basically, you prepare a maximally entangled state, two qubit maximally entangled, you put like, well, one qubit goes like the upper part, other one goes to the bottom. Well, here, we saw it before that this, this whole thing here can be understood as the complex conjugate of U2. And now here, this M here stands like for Bell measurement. I'm doing this. Essentially, I don't know, the ones who are familiar probably know that this is basically quantum teleportation protocol, where you prepare a maximally entangled state, and here you perform a joint measurement in this two system, <coughs> Bell measurement. And if you just follow, if you do a calculation like now this time, like T0, what's the initial, what's the state of the system here? What is here? And after the measurement, so here this Bell measurement, I'm saying that I have four outcomes each one correspond to one of the Bell state. And I'm parameterizing the outcomes by this i and j that can be like zero or one. Or if you're not so familiar, don't bother so much, but just trust me that what comes out in the circuit is this. And this i and j, they are the outcomes of this Bell measurement. And so if i is zero and j is zero, well, this becomes identity. And for any input state and for any unitary, I attain the task. And that happens probably one over four. That's basically the probability of having this, uh, if you imagine this port-based teleportation with a single port, that's exactly what you get. So does it make sense? I hope. The ones who are familiar with quantum circuits, as I said, it's quite like trivial, I would say. But if you're seeing this model for the first time, it may be confusing. But my claim is that it's possible and it's simple. It involves only very standard operations people can do in the lab, it's okay. So, and also something nice here that I wrote in this way, because what we like to call this delayed input state. In the beginning, what I required is to transform U to U inverse. But basically I had this circuit in mind, right? You, like, if you imagine a quantum state that comes, a few things happen, if you apply this unitary, a kind of decoder happens, and what comes out is the inverse of this unitary here. But this circuit here does something more. Why? Because this initial state here that can be any quantum state is required only in time t1, while the unitary is in time t0. So what does, that, what does that mean? Like if I come to you and I say, hey, this is a qubit unitary, and I hand it to you, so you can use it a single time. And you go, you make some use, I take it back. I, one week after, I say, ah, oh, now I want to implement the inverse of this unitary. You can. So in this came for free. We didn't require for this property. So good. So now well, we had like this example, we saw like 
a few questions pop out, right? Is it optimal? And like, well, this nice qubits, but how does it go for a larger dimension? And probability success is one over four, like is it possible to increase like in a fair way? And in order to tackle these problems, well, we're going to use this mathematical formalism, or this higher order quantum operation, the super maps that appeared here in this conference many times. And this, it's basically the good mathematics to do like an analysis of this problem. And well, in this super maps thing, like, there is a notion of like super channel that works as following. So here, understand this as an arbitrary input quantum channel. So this is a quantum operation that can be anything. And this, it's an operation I like to put this E for encoder and D for decoder. So that's one way to transform quantum channels, right? So basically, if you measure quantum state, you come to encoder, apply an unitary decoder, and what comes out, it's this output channel. Uh, well, and this was studied by several papers. I think probably these two were the first ones. And you can ask one nice question. So clearly, this transforms channels to channels. Very simple, right? It's one way to do the super channel. But what is the most general super channel? So, and in these papers here, like they, well, this mathematical equation may be more confusing, but I like to put it here. Just uh, my convention, convention I like, I put this tilde to emphasize things that are like maps, linear maps, like channels. And it's double tilde said it's a super channel, like one order higher. I do that because when I write with my hand, I cannot do this math call, this latex thing. <laughs> so, but basically, under very like reasonable assumptions, so saying that I want the most general transformation that transforms quantum channels to quantum channels, it should preserve a notion of completely positive, and it should preserve this trace preservingness. Mm -hmm. You can prove that this is actually the most general thing you can do, but it's quite nice. Right? So great. With all this mathematics, we can go back to our problem and try to answer some questions like, is it optimal? And it turns out that, yes, our, our protocol that we just wrote like randomly, you can prove that it's indeed optimal. And how does it go for qubits? And then it turns out that, well, the probability of success is zero. So it's not possible to do it anymore. Quite sad. And how can we increase the success probability? Well, you, here you can imagine many things, right? So for example, you can say, that, oh, you're required to be exact. And what if you accept some errors? Like, and the way we thought it was very fair is to consider more calls or more copies or more uses. So at least like for me, imagine again this problem. I come with you to uh, it's just unitary, a black box. You don't know how it works. So you can use it, and I take it back, for example. Or you can use it as much as you want. In principle, you don't need to use a single time. Right? You can use it many times. And you can even now imagine, well, I have a trivial solution to your problem for unitary inverse. If you give me this unitary, I use it infinitely many times. I do like process tomography. I know exactly what is this unitary. Well, then I have a matrix. I write this matrix in the board. I find the inverse by hand. It's very easy, I invert it, especially if it's qubit. And I apply the inverse. But, and then now the figure of merit we are going to consider is basically the number of uses we have. But it's quite sensible to quantify this number of uses. But in this circuit picture here, we're going to imagine like, the number of times this U will appear. So and now we are going to look again to this problem. But considering this case, like this, what we call parallel circuits that transforms unitary to unitary inverse with some probability. So this probabilistic heraldic, probability of success, and this sequential case. And this special sequential, it appears also many times in the literature. These are the quantum combs. It's essentially this channel with memory, quantum strategy, quantum channels with sec well, it's that. Great. So now I'm going to jump and basically show the results. So, and then after I discuss a bit about the technical parts, so maybe even drop like if people that are interested, can, we can talk. So for the parallel case, it turns out then it's possible to find the optimal probability of success. So this is actually the best. We can prove that nothing can be better than that. And the proof is constructive. And well, in the next slides, I will talk a bit more. But basically, it's essentially port-based teleportation. That well, this is this number here we got like from this port-based teleportation paper. Sorry, what was the case again? Uh, sorry, maybe I didn't say k is the number of uses, number of calls. <coughs> so here we have some dimensions too. K would be like here. Great. So now for parallel, for dimension higher than two, but it's the number of uses. It's smaller 
then d minus 1. The probability of success is 0. Okay. And another result here, now parallel strategies, the number of uses, like it's greater than d minus 1. And then in this case, for general dimension, we couldn't find the exact, the, the optimal protocol. It's not so beautiful like this, but we could find upper bounds and lower bounds. Well, to be honest, I don't think these things are important. What I think it's important is that asymptotically, for a large number of, when k is very large, this is essentially 1 minus 1 over k. And our upper bound and lower bound coincides asymptotically. So that means it's like asymptotically tight. Good. So then it's possible to do it for q. It's, you just need more uses. Moreover, it's possible in parallel. We, ah. Nice. And another result that is the optimal parallel protocol, even though we couldn't find the optimal for any dimension, we can show that the optimal is always delayed input <laughs> state. Basically, we can, in this picture here, we can remove this wire from here, so this wire, and put it like here after the use of unitaries. And that's and this comes for free. So the optimal parallel, it's, it's a delayed input state. And we also consider then sequential. And if the number of calls is smaller than d minus 1, the probability of success is still 0. So, well, this d minus 1 like, really means something. And for sequential, or maybe he's too low people in the back, but the sequential, if you have many number of users, like more, the number of calls is greater than d minus 1, the probability of success approaches 1 exponentially. So then we also see something like there's an exponential gap in terms of success probability. For any fixed dimension, the probability of success in parallel is like 1 over k, 1 minus 1 over k, divided by 1 minus exponential. And so, as I said, I don't want to go technical, and of course, I'm very happy to talk to people that want, but maybe it's good to show how it works for qubits. Well, how do we do our sequential protocol? Basically, we just get the previous protocol that I mentioned that works for one call, and that's what comes out. And one standard strategy in like probability theory, so if you want your probability of success to increase, what do you do? You just repeat many times. So for example, if you want to get heads, flipping point, like, you flip only about tails, and you want to do more, you just flip many times. Just keep repeating. But here, in this problem, we cannot keep repeating this circuit directly. Why? Because what comes out in one use, so that's a state that comes out. It's this unitary x, y, in the input state. But the input state, if you check, it's kind of like lost. Because since I don't know the unitary, I cannot erase this part. I cannot invert this part. But if I have many uses, well, I know i and j. I, make, I spend one use more to cancel this u. And this i and j I know, so I can cancel this part here, recover my input state, and repeat. So basically, it's possible to recover the initial input state. So that one use, you try. If you fail, you have another use to cancel your unsuccessful thing. Then you repeat. So it's also, I'd say, very simple. And it, it has this, we can actually prove it's not optimal, but it exponential in terms of success probability, so it's quite satisfying. And a bit more on the technical parts, but not like crazy technical. It's the, basically, this, our idea, uh, it's somehow we broke the unitary inversion in two parts. One, it's the complex conjugation, and the other part, it's essentially teleportation. So let's just see a bit more how teleportation works in terms of quantum circuits. Like, uh, sometimes people refer to this as like gate teleportation. So this thing here, like this circuit on the top, represents what people many times call like gate teleportation. You prepare a maximum entangled state, now let's say for any dimension, on the lower part here, you perform a unitary D. And then here, you perform a joint Bell measurement. And the state that comes out, it's something like that. With some probability of success, actually 1 over D square, you apply this unitary. You kind of teleported this unitary that was here. But since the maximally entangled state has this nice property, then if you apply some operator on Alice part, you can transfer to Bob by paying the price of one transposition. So basically, like, teleportation provides unitary transposition. So that's the idea behind unitary transposition. And well, and now we just need to do complex conjugation. Like, if you know how to do teleportation, provides 
transposition. Now we just need to generalize this idea of complex conjugation. And actually, this was done before by this Buddhist monk, that you just <laughs> apply one isometry. So basically, if you have a d-dimensional state, you apply this isometry. It may sound a bit complicated, but what, what is happening here, like if you have a d-dimensional system, you transform this state to the anti-symmetric subspace when you have d minus 1 copies. And this isometry here, like, oh, it's, it's basically just transforming a d-dimensional state to this d minus 1 complex conjugate. And well, one way to prove is just doing a brute force calculation, but we can think a little bit like why it works, but the, it works. So now uh, the protocol for any QD is very simple. Prepare a maximum entangled state, apply this isometry. You are here in the anti-symmetric <coughs> space, ap apply all this unitary, recover here, this block here, this complex conjugation, this larger block, this transposition, transposition conjugations, it's the adjoint, the dagger, well, if it's unitary dagger is inverse, over. And uh, another result that we got in this paper as well, in order to get back, that this protocol is actually optimal in the sense that it requires d minus one users. So in the previous paper, like, the, the monk only said that it was possible, but he didn't show that it's like optimal in terms of success probability. So. Question yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> and now in our parallel, actually, in terms of technicality, I would say that the hardest thing, maybe, well, I don't know. But one, one thing of this work is to show this exponential gap, so to, to ensure that parallel protocols cannot be so good. And basically, the, what we have done to analyze parallel protocols is to use the part based teleportation that Michal presented. Because as I said, Teleportation performs transposition, roughly. And now if you want to increase the probability of success, what could you do? Well, if you just think, let's try this part-based teleportation. And it turns out that it works, and we can show that it's also optimal. And that's, so this number here, it's, I think maybe it's not exactly the same number you present, because you didn't optimize over the state. Well, but basically you can find this work of Mihao. And also something nice is that it was also useful for us. It's this paper, what people call this unitary store and retrieve by Michal Setlak, Alessandro Bizzi, and Mari Zeman. That in the, the paper, they ask like a very similar question. Uh, actually, not very similar. It turned out to be similar, but it's this question. Like, I give you some k uses of a unitary. And then I say, use it k times and give me back. And then one week after, like, I perform this unitary. Like, should store and then retrieve. That's how they name. It also appeared before, I think you also worked this unitary learning. <coughs> and it turns out this unitary and retrieve, it's actually equivalent to our problem of unitary transposition. Equivalent in the sense that you just change where you apply the unitary, and this is the optimal protocol for both. So, I don't know if I have time. Well, <coughs> not, can we go beyond, like, so that's what I had to say, like for the sequential, this quantum circuits thing. But, well, can we go beyond, like, in principle, when I first asked the question, I didn't say anything about quantum circuits, right? I just presented because well, it's good for imagination, but the initial question, it's not a quantum circuit question. And it turns out, then, we know that quantum circuits, this formalism inputs, like, uh, restrictions for quantum mechanics, right? And one nice example, I would say, is this, like, quantum switch that appears here many times, right? Well, that basically you put like in a superposition of two paths, like you, and these objects in principle can help when you have more users, when you have a two users, instead of doing like sequential circuit, we do this like quantum switch, like does it help? So if you worked with the quantum switch, if you're familiar, maybe you notice that this actually, it cannot help. Quantum switch is not useful for our problem. Why? Because we're using the same unitary twice. So imagine we have a like U, U, and you want to transform to u inverse. But if you have u, u, the quantum switch will transform u, u to u composed with u. So well, it's not a formal proof, but you may convince yourself that the quantum switch doesn't work. But well, again, we can imagine what are the most general super channels now that transforms like a pair of channels to another channel. And well, basically, that's what appeared like in other parts of literature. And, 
many people refer to it as this process matrices. They are basically super channels, but with not only a single slot, with many, but they are not forced to be quantum circuits, so they are like consistent with quantum mechanics, if you want, but they, cannot, but they, they may not be described by quantum circuit. They may have this indefinite causal order. And now, well, this, this process matrix, like in principle, they don't go against quantum mechanics, so we should consider. And how powerful are these process matrices for this particular task? And it turns out that, again, if the number of calls is smaller than D minus one, the period of success is still zero. So we still need many calls, or maybe not many, we still need more than D minus one. And what happens if the number of calls is greater than D minus one? What's the success probability? Well, if you go back, like how we got our protocol before, this uh, intuition on teleportation, like we tried, oh, we like this quantum circuit, so we draw, then you ended up, you develop some intuition. Right? But now, this indefinite causal order, okay, the quantum switch, we start to understand better, but the switch is not good for us, it doesn't work. So we need to have something more general than the quantum switch, where we have no intuition. And so in order to tackle this problem, we rephrase the question in terms of like semi-definite programming. Well, uh, here actually I just put this to have a picture. <laughs> I don't expect people to understand unless they already know what it means. But basically, I just want to say that it's possible to rewrite this problem, like finding the maximum success probability in terms of semi-definite programming. But while well, I went to the computer, I put this there, and that's more or less what I got. So here, let's check this case. This is dimension for the, what's the optimal parallel protocol, optimal sequential, and optimal like general, this indefinite causal one. Or if, when k is, k is 1, actually it doesn't even make sense to say parallel sequential in that case. It's single use, right? Okay, of course they're the same. But when k is 2, then there is a gap. Well, we knew that there was a gap between parallel and sequential length, but we didn't know about a gap between sequential and indefinite causal order. So it means that there is something that goes, it's a valid process matrix, it's a valid super chain of two slots, but it's not the quantum switch, it doesn't look like the quantum switch, but it's useful for this task. And, well, okay, these are just numbers somehow, but it shows that there is an advantage. So, oh, now we're close to the end. And I'll just try to summarize a bit. So I think the main message is that universal unitary inversion is possible, and parallel, it behaves like this. This is an upper and lower bound. Basically, if you forget about dimension of these numbers, like the way it behaves for large K is like this. The sequential, it behaves like this. Actually, it can be larger than that. We don't know, but this is attainable, definitely attainable. And it's constructive and, I'll say, somehow simple. But it's not always possible. Like, you have this d minus 1 cause that's strong constraint. And, and I think this kind, so as I said, my, what I wanted to do in the beginning is this problem of inversion, but also to develop more intuition, this super channels like, well, as I said, like we know much about quantum channel theory, like this quantum channels, how they behave, but the super channels, well, there are some papers, these questions, they have been there, but we still don't know so much when compared to this lower level channel. And while well, in, in this path, we found some new methods, like we apprentice this SDP approach that it appeared before in literature, but what we do is a bit different we can discuss technicalities later. And we, we also analyze the power and the limitations of indefinite causal order. Like sometimes they are useful, but you cannot do everything with them. They are also limited. One thing that we debate a lot in our group, like we don't know much in terms of like applications for that. So for me personally, this is already an application. I don't know, because you will get universe, unitary, you transform to its inverse. But I don't know, there's something to debate with people here. And also, like the, we kind of exploited this concept of delayed input state protocols that appeared for free, were quite, like, quite interesting. We, we started the project, we didn't even talk about that. After we realized that it's essentially a generalization of this store and retrieve that appeared under the name of learning. And then, basically, that's it. Mm. Like this, yes, 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 yes.
Yeah, so actually the problem that Miguel asks is somehow a bit harder than what we do. So, because in our case, so let's consider, check this sequential circuit here, like for example. We start, we can do like this encoders here, like in between any step, and this encoder act everywhere. In the one from Miguel, the question is a bit different. So when you can get the result of Miguel and translate to our language. But in Miguel, for example, the probability of success is not constant. It depends on some unknown interaction. So the work of Miguel, it's basically, you have like a quantum system, like the qubit, what we, your target is part here. You come with an auxiliary state, it will be similar to this line that I have here, and you approach to the system and you remove. And then Miguel said, well, if you, just because you're approaching, there will be some interaction, and he makes no hypothesis like this with this unit here, and then comes out. And after, Miguel considers quantum comb only in the auxiliary system. So it's a more restrictive scenario. But so if you translate the work of Miguel to our language, the probability of success is like very, very low. But it's somehow a harder problem. So it's related, but not exactly the same thing. Uh, uh, just a small remark. I think maybe I made this last time when you made mm -hmm. it. So you can, with this delay, the input, you can even think that the input is not defined at all, because mm -hmm. the input is maybe a part of an entangled state. And, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the order, mm -hmm. and it's everything finished, and you don't have excess, and yes. then you define the input. And so, and about the applications, mm -hmm. um, there is this in, in fluctuations theorem in ter quantum thermodynamic state. Usually, need to have this uh, two time process. I don't know uh, it, um, what's the name. Point two point measurements. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then you go uh, forward, and uh, then you ha and, and you measure at the beginning and the end, and then you make inverse the process in mm -hmm. backwards. Now usually they do know what the unit is, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but imagine you want to make a machine that mm -hmm. uh, works for any unit. Yes. I mean, it just came to my mind while uh -huh. you were speaking about. Mm -hmm. Actually, so one comment on that: there are a few other things that I didn't put in this slide. They are not even in the paper, but it's somehow an argument like of, of to see. In, in, and what about the scenario where you do know the unitary you have? Is such a thing useful, or is it nice only when it's unknown? I would argue that it's still useful, even if you do know. Because if you do know, you have a, basically you need to change a lot your circuit for each unitary. Yes. If someone said, ah, this is sigma x, and ah, okay, sigma x is easy, I don't need to do anything. This is another unitary, and then you need to re-prepare. And this one, it's constant. And, it, and it, it's exponential. So even in the case that you do know, I believe that it may find applications. And it's always what really you know about the unitary. Uh -huh. Because sometimes you can have and this is also related to the scaling. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes you, you, we know that every d-dimensional unity can be decomposed as a composition of two-dimensional unitaries. Mm -hmm. So imagine that somebody gives already this decomposition. Of course, you don't know it, none of the unitaries in the two-dimensional subspaces, but, it's, but you already know that it's decomposed. Now you can use your mm -hmm. trick for the two-dimensional and, and show that even for higher dimensional than two, you can have probabilistic perfect mm -hmm. inversion. But you know a little bit more. You know that the decomposition is in two-dimensional subspaces. You don't know anything more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this will Yeah, it is a thing you mentioned, maybe in a thousand. Yeah. yeah. Um, any other question? Matt? Yeah, so do you have like a strong kind of intuition? Can you like sum up in a sentence or two why the probability is zero rather than just small? So this question is funny. So I think depending on the day, I would say yes. Depending on the day, I would say no. So maybe the fair thing is to be no. Like the, for me, the intuition is the proof. So the intuition why it works, maybe I can say yes, because it's related to. So there are a few things that you can observe. Like it's basically the idea behind this anti-symmetric, totally anti-symmetric state. Because total antimatrix state, like it exists when you have basically, if it's dimension d, you should imagine to have like d copies. So for, for qubits, there is only one totally antimatrix state. The yeah, the singlet. Also the SUD singlet. Yes, yes, and b that's basically the idea behind. So I think if you are familiar with this totally antimatrix state, maybe this will make sense. Some, somehow, if you see what is happening here. If you 
flip this guy here and change the position to here. That's exactly the totally anti-symmetric state. And this flip here, like, it's somehow like a kind of a transposition related to the Maxwell entangled state. And then like, by playing around with that, you can see why it works. Because in principle, the maximally, the totally asymmetric state, if you apply like d times u, then the state is not changed. But here you do like a transposition, and then the, this, uh, I can write in the board later, but you can have some intuition like, if you play around. But the reason why this, why you really need this d minus 1, why it fails when you have d minus 2, I would say I have no intuition. I think it's the proof. And we do by contradiction. So, a little bit, yeah. Maybe the answer is no. <laughs> I don't have any intuition. So, some intuition is probably that uh, if one three processes enough the question, it, do, it turns out to be that you have to find an intertwiner between the representation you have in yes. input uh, and the one you have in output. And yes. That's yes. only possible if that representation is contained in the tensor. Yes. The, the only thing that blocks me to say that this is a good issue, because in this idea somehow, or maybe I missed some, but if you have no auxiliary system, I would say that this argument is very good. But when you have w potentially one auxiliary system, it's not clear for me why. There is some processing to be done from the, the, the original question to this statement. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I think in some way it probably can be done. But mm -hmm. We already solved the problem, so mm -hmm. we may say who cares. Actually, Moin, Moin also. Yeah made an ah, yes, he also well basically there is an alternative proof right that Moin came that maybe it's more intuitive. Okay. All right. No other questions? If not, let's thank you again.